Hey everybody, DK here with Adventures in Dirt, and welcome, welcome to a late start here on Digger Spotlight. We had a little bit of technical difficulties. I'm telling you, I don't know what's going on. Uh, everything worked great on the test, right? But hey, thanks, uh, thanks for showing up for another episode of Digger Spotlight. I really appreciate y'all being here. And we've got a great guest with us tonight. I know we've been promoting it kind of all week long. And I can't wait to uh, have this guest on and, and share him with you and, and, and talk to him what he's all about. He's, just, he's got a lot of experience. He's been, in, he's been not only digging for a long time, he's also been in the whole YouTube game for a long time. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. It should be a good time. So hope you all are uh, ready for a good night. We may go longer than an hour. We'll see how it goes. We'll just have to wing that. But uh, I want to bring your attention to the text that's rolling down below the screen here. If you do have a question uh, for our guest tonight, if you just type the at symbol Adventures in Dirt, you'll see my name pop up there. Click on it. Type your question out, and we'll be sure to see you in the chat and, and get to you in the chat. Uh, I see some of my moderators here. I really appreciate their help tonight. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and bring in our special guest tonight, uh, Greg Tony with uh, Saving History with SC Digger. I know a lot of you are familiar with him. Greg, how are you? Hey, what's up? How's it going? <laughs> well, a little, little bit of a rough, rough start. I apologize about that. That's okay. <laughs> yeah, lower your lower your volume. I think because the delay is going to get you. So make yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out the uh, the audio thing here because I've got the the original feed. Mm -hmm. And I've got that going, so right. I've got two different uh, us. Right. So uh, on the window, that is the YouTube page where you're yep. watching the stream. Uh, go ahead, lower that volume down. Actually, on the app, um, got it. And that should be that should take care of any echo. <laughs> awesome. Sometimes that delay uh, gets a little crazy. So uh, I think I got it figured out. <laughs> all right, great. Hey, good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you so much for doing this uh, with us here on Digger Spotlight. I've been wanting to get you on for a while, so I'm sure glad we were able to find some time to uh, to get together. Hey, excited about it. And like I said, you know, uh, if, if it was easy, it wouldn't be worth doing, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. I was just looking over in the chat, and I was seeing that uh, we have uh, MG. MG's checking in. I see a 5280 Adventures. He's my digging partner. Uh, his name's Tony. He's, uh, he's one of my moderators also. Uh, history preserved uh, is in there. What's up, buddy? I'm glad uh, he was able to come over. Who else we got in here? Yeah, just looking to see who all's coming in. MG, yep. I see you. Terry Solomon, glad to have you. Yep. Thin Blue Diggers, welcome aboard. Yeah, Terry Solomon, good to see you, bud. Yeah, Thin Blue Diggers, good. So, Levin coming in right now. You know, the late start uh, is probably uh, is, is people got to catch up with that. I'm sure it's letting people know we're live right now. Uh, Ozarks Detector, hey, how are you? Good to see you. Great, great website he's got over there at Detecting 365. Uh, hey, you all should head on over there. Oh, yeah. Board, man. Yeah, great. Good to, good, to, good to see all these people here. Let me get over to our screen here and see what we got going on. So, hey, Greg, why don't we uh, – why don't we start? Hey, and I have to apologize to you, man. You, you're, you're a very special guest to me. Uh, you have so much that we can talk about. We may go longer than an hour. I don't I'm, know if we're going to get here. it done. I have nowhere to be. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, let's let let's start. I mean, what whatever made you get into metal detecting? And of all the things we could do in this world, what what made you get wow, into man. metal detecting? Yeah, um, I can remember growing up. I've always had a uh, an affinity for history, anyway. I grew up in central Alabama, and I can remember seven, eight years old, starting to pick up Native American stuff. We'd go hunting. My dad would be out in the dove field. They'd be hunting. They wouldn't let me shoot, you know, a gun. So I wandered around picking up rocks, and it, it kind of was instilled in me from a very early age. And I remember I had a, you know, a Radio Shack, you know, a metal detector. have no idea what brand it was. Uh, but, you know, 10 years old and, you know, as long as it was on top of the ground, you could hear the, the signal. But it was kind of weird for my 10th anniversary. I remember my wife and I talking about, well, what, you know, that's yeah, a special anniversary. What do you want for your anniversary? And I said, I, I want a real metal detector. And she looked at me like I was crazy. And uh, I got online, did some research and I bought a real metal detector at the time. And, um, you know, Little did I know what it was going to get me into when 
uh, when I did that. Um, from that first machine, I probably upgraded from it within a two, you know, two or three months, and what? that was almost twenty years ago. Uh, that started me on this uh, this obsession. What did you What did you upgrade to? Um, my, well, the second, the, I mean, I, my, the very first machine I ever had was a Quick Draw Two uh, Bounty Hunter, and found some stuff with it. And um, the next machine I got was a Fisher CZ Five. Um, and then from there I went to, I mean, I've probably, gosh, I mean, 20 plus different machines since then I've used, uh, uh, Tesoro, I used a lot of Tesoros early on, uh, Tesoro Lobo Super Track was a really good, it made as a gold machine, but it was a really good, uh, relic machine. Um, uh, probably my favorite machine that I wish I still had was my Shadow X5. Uh, Troy built an amazing machine, made some amazing finds with it, and somewhere along what the way. What is that? I'm, I've never Troy heard Shadow, of that. I've never heard of that. Well, a Troy Shadow, uh, he had a line of detectors. He had an X2 that was basically a Tesoro. Uh, then he came out with an X5 and an X2, I mean X3, that were um, they, you know, were his own design. And um, I, again, you know, it was kind of an overbuild. I mean, it was a it was an over the top quality machine, and there weren't a lot out there. If you ever come across a Troy X5 for sale, um, I would suggest buy it because I probably, if I find one, I'll probably get another one just because it was such a great machine. Really, really. That and sounds... then have, have continued on, and uh, you know, now I'm uh, using t uh, Technetics machines. I've used Technetics Fisher. Uh, I've used Nautilus, everything across the board. So yeah. uh, I think I've learned over time, though, it's not so – the machine has a lot to do with it, but the user has a lot to do with it as well. Just experience and learning what you're hearing and swinging it, you know, getting out there and hunting. Yeah, spending that time with it for sure. You know, I, everyone has their own favorite of what type of machines they're swinging. And somebody once said, you know, the best machine out there is the one that you learn to master, the one that you learn to put the time in and, and, and really master. And, you know, I've only been doing this for a few years, so, I mean, I don't have any, anywhere near the experience you guys do, but I tend to believe in that. You put the hours in, you, you get to get to learn those little squeaks before and after <laughs> the tone, you know, those can tell you an awful lot. So uh, that's awesome. So you're from South Carolina. Yeah. Born and raised yeah. or the, Born and Sorry, raised, like oh, um, right. uh, like I said, I grew up in Central Alabama. Moved to actually Clemson, South Carolina, when I was about the ninth grade, and have been here ever since. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm not in low country, which I do get down there a lot. I mean, you know, the the low country of South Carolina is kind of like mecca, you know, <laughs> as far as relic hunting goes. Um, but uh, you know, being in South Carolina. Uh, both from you know relic hunting and uh, Native American stuff, uh, we don't have you know any lack for having places to go. Yeah, I bet. So uh, you know you talked a lot. So okay, what is your uh, what what do you do for a living? What do you do for a living? Can we go there? I, oh, I, no, yeah. Personal stuff's great. That yeah. I mean, I I think it it helps to get to know, you know, who we're watching and listening to. So um, I am a uh, professor of communication uh, at the local technical college. So I've been teaching public speaking um, at the local college for 22 years. Uh oh, I'm so, in trouble. Uh, you know, and, and actually I had my, I, you know, my undergraduate degree was in communications. Uh, I thought I was going to be the next Ted Koppel. You know, I was going to go into the to media and be on TV and, uh, you know, I, I didn't, obviously, but I was, uh, you know, mass comm major, got my master's degree in mass comm at Auburn and um, had the experience of teaching as a graduate student. But that's kind of what led me into getting into into video work, because, you know, back when I was learning how to do it, we we're using tape. And, you know, to edit, you had to sit down with all the machines. You had to, like, set edit points. And uh, it was quite a labor-intensive process. And then all of a sudden, I discovered digital video and uh, that you could do this on your computer at home. And uh, I can remember watching a fellow, um, uh, Mudslide Slim. Mudslide Slim. Yep, Sal Gutteso. And some people out there may know, know Sal. 
uh, because he still runs trips to, uh, to England and uh, he's involved in the hobby. Um, and, and Ozark's Detector, I see your questions over there. Um, so we'll, we'll certainly get to those. Um, he, there was probably five of us putting up metal detecting videos back 2005, 2006. And I wow, saw him that long, that long ago. Wow. That's Oh yeah. That's and I, I said, I said, I can do that. And I had my little Kodak camera. Uh, I think I probably was shooting at, uh, you know, 240, 360 frames per second. I mean, it was, uh, I mean, it was very, very, I mean, it looked like we were videoing with a potato. Uh, <laughs> Go back and watch my early videos. They're yeah. grainy and you know they're, they're really kind of hard to get through. I think some but, of your earlier um, videos was from DIV, wasn't it? Wasn't it from yeah. a DIV vig, uh, dig? Yeah, you know. And the thing is, I go back and look, and I mean, because I, I I had the opportunity to go to about seventeen different DIVs, and probably for the first half of those, I wasn't shooting video. Um, you know, I can remember. Sal actually was shooting video when they discovered the Corduroy Road. And so he has video of it, but really nobody else was doing it. And I look back, you know, the, the things that I could have covered uh, if I was doing it then. Now, you know, like I said, there was five of us doing it when I started, and there's, you know, 5,000 of us doing it now. Um, but that's great because that gives everybody an opportunity to record their finds um, and, um, you know, and show others what they're doing. Yeah, I think in, in doing my, doing my research with you and trying to uh, where's your dog? Okay, there's <laughs> the it. dog. She just she just appeared. Yeah, what's her name? Uh, that is Essie. Essie. So Essie. <laughs> that's awesome. I think I saw that video on that corduroy road. That was uh, amazing. It was pretty impressive. One of, one of the most amazing things I've ever seen uncovered. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, also, uh, you know, that was a real old video there. And yep. uh, earlier on, I think I was watching one of. Uh, uh, Bo's videos over at Aqua Chigger, and he he found a uh, corduroy road kind of in the side of an embankment of a river uh, not too long ago. So that was pretty <clears throat> that was pretty incredible. And just learning about learning about that and all the stuff that could be in there. I mean, it's it's just endless. Um, the stuff they were pulling out of that because they were they were six feet deep, and it was what preserved it. It was down in the mud, and when they were pu they were pulling out leather goods. Uh, things like brogans, you know, boots, uh, 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 sheets for uh, bayonets. They were pulling out uh, the leather from uh, um, um, cappies. Uh, the buttons that were coming out of the ground were still brass, and they weren't gold gilted. They were just brass and not tarnished. Hmm. Uh, the the bullets were gray. You know, they hadn't turned white. It, it was crazy. And somebody, it, it, you know, Ozark asked earlier, what was the most amazing thing that made you go wow? seeing that corduroy road uncovered what that made me go wow wow now were you able to dig that road were you able to dig in there with them with them guys i wasn't, and, uh... I wasn't in that trench okay uh, right. I, I uncovered uh i probably dug 10 11 huts at various divs most of these this was at stoneman switch that so basically div one through five was at stoneman switch there was one in the middle that went somewhere else i think um, but this was the, um, you know, the, the train depot, basically the supply depot, uh, right there in Stafford. And, um, I dug a lot of huts there. Unfortunately, I wasn't in the pit. Now, all of a sudden, you know, the, as they dug, the wall started caving in and they made them close it back in because it became a safety issue. But How many of them DIVs have you been to, Greg? I think about 17. Wow. Um, I, you wow. know, I, I just got in, people keep going, why haven't you been to another DIV? And I got to, I, I teach. So when I can get off uh, work is just kind of limited. And they kind of made a shift as when the DIV was and it interfered with when I could get off of school. And it, it you know, like I said, just wasn't able to take time off and, so there was there was a couple of years there where I didn't go to Culpeper at all. Now I have been to uh, a few of uh, James Bibbs' um, uh, uh, just go detecting hunts. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. He invited me up, and um, and so I've been back to Culpeper. And uh, I mean, I think it, it's a hard place to hunt. The ground is highly mineralized. If you don't have the right equipment, you can struggle. Um, you know, certain machines. You know. It, PIs work real well. VLF struggle unless you know how to use them. Go, going back to that Shadow X5 yeah. that I mentioned, Troy uh, Shadow, <clears throat> that was before people were using PIs, before people were using the TDI, 
before people were using the uh, um, the Infinium up there. Um, I was digging targets with that X5 <laughs> in that they call it the red dirt, the red duck uh, of cold pepper, but it's like mineralized powdered iron, and uh, was digging stuff. So yeah, you have to have the right equipment too. So it's it's, it's hard hunting. So you regret? Do you still have that machine? Which one? The the, uh, the shadow. The shadow. Oh. No, somewhere along the way, I decided it was a good idea to sell it, and uh, yeah, it's gone. Do you regret so, that? <laughs> oh, absolutely. I wish I had it back because it, it was it was a great machine. <laughs> I'm sorry, the the dogs decided to. That's all right. Do whatever yeah, she's, she's doing, she's coming oh, she's on in. I'm seeing. I'll turn so you can't see her. So. That's it. I'm checking out your your uh, your your background there. What's that? Uh, what's that uniform about over there on the? Uh... That oh okay. See, I used way back once upon a time. I used to reenact. Mm. And uh, this before I had kids, and I had an amazing Confederate kit. I mean, I went all out on replicating, you know, authenticity and everything. But one of the things that everybody, no matter what side you reenacted, especially Confederate, you always had a, a Union kit. You always had a federal uniform in case they needed to throw you on the other side because sometimes you go to reenactment and you had, you know, 200 Confederates and <laughs> 30 Union soldiers. <laughs> little and unfair so, fight. Uh, yeah, so that was, I, I, it wasn't worth selling. I couldn't make anything from my Union kit, so I kept it. So it looks good in the relic room as far as <laughs> display goes. I know, I'm being funny, guys. Yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> we, uh, Tar Heel Diggin wants to know, hey, rank your favorite type of hunting from colonial to Civil War to Native American artifacts. I mean, what's your one, two, three? What's your line up there? Okay, this may surprise you, but Native American stuff is number one for me. Oh, I've been doing that over 35 years. Um, again, growing up in central Alabama, you know, that's where I got my start, my love for history. Um, honestly, I have to say it's a close tie between Civil War and Colonial. I, I've always been a you know, Civil War relic hunter, um, but once me and Russ found that British camp here in the upstate of South Carolina— it, once it gets in your blood, oh, I mean, I mean, we were digging stuff. You know, you're digging stuff 250, 300 years old. Yeah. And, you know, where we found this camp, you know, that was before, you know, Charleston was a city. Uh, that was the frontier, basically the upstate of South Carolina. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's hard to rank colonial versus civil war because, you know, it you know and when i say colonial you know you can find a colonial home site where you dig some flat buttons and things but when you get into colonial military stuff hard to beat that's uh, yeah, pretty cool hey everyone in chat why don't you guys throw up uh what your favorite type of hunting is uh, for those of you that hunt different uh different types of do t two different types of hunting why don't you guys throw up what you guys like in there in chat and for those of you that just join us i want to welcome you to digger spotlight our guest tonight is greg tony with Saving history with SC Digger. Uh, if you don't have, if you don't know about his channel, definitely look down in the description. I got links to his website. I got a link to his YouTube page, to his Facebook pay, Facebook page, and also to his Instagram account. So check him out. He's been around for a long time, and uh, he's got a lot of great stuff on there. He's been doing a lot of stuff. So what's uh, what's some of your favorite early memories uh, of out there digging? Like some uh, not really like oh wow, but sort of hey that was a really cool experience when I did that. You know, I have to think about one of the, I mean, one of the, my best memories um, of digging, probably uh, used to dig with a fellow named John Miles, good good buddy of mine down, he lived down in, um, in um, um, I just lost the name of it, uh, the, the horse races, uh, I want to say Chapin, it's not Chapin, it's um, down below Columbia. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> Somebody post here. Where are the horse races down the south part of, of, of South Carolina? Um, it'll it'll pop in my head. But anyway, <laughs> we, we got down there, and we actually found a uh, virgin Confederate camp. Oh. And, you know, I mean, nowadays to find, and this was probably still 10 years ago, um, to find a, a virgin anything, whether it's a home site <laughs> or a Civil War camp, or anything like that is amazing. And I can remember, you know, he had, he had gotten access or permission uh, to, the, to the site. And it was actually along where the, the retreat route 
Camden, by the way, Camden. It just popped in my head. It was along the retreat route for the Americans from the Battle of Camden. And so we were chasing, you know, uh, Rev War stuff is what we were looking for. And so, you know, there were, you know, pretty big property it had been timbered and everything. And so I remember telling him, okay, I'm going to head up to the top of this hill um, to see what's here. And he, you know, John was going to head around the other way. And I got to the top of the hill and got a really good signal. And uh, it turned out to be a, the frame from a coin purse, you know, like the little, you know, where it would have had a leather bag. You opened it up. Little top snap. And okay, so that's a good brass target. And I said, okay, well, better slow down. Maybe there is a coin laying around here. A couple of feet away, got another, just uh, probably the sweetest tone you could ever imagine. And I was like, sounds good. Maybe I got me a coin from the coin purse. And dug it up, and it turned out to be a Confederate staff officer's button. Um, and then it was on because basically every two feet we were digging good brass targets. I mean, things, I mean, gun parts, sword, I dug a sword out of it. Um, wow. you know, uh, lead, you know, brass, uh, like bullets and, and musket balls. We were digging, uh, toe plates and hill plates. Uh, I said gun parts. Um, I think we ended up with 16 or 17 Confederate buttons out of it by the time we were done. Uh, they were South Carolinas. They were um, um, script eyes, block eyes. Um, it, it was amazing. Mm. So, I, yeah, if I had to pick something, that has to be it. Wow. Hey, Mr. Terry Solomon wants to ask, do you sell your fines? Have you ever sold your fines? I, I do not sell fines that I personally dig. Now, uh, let, me, let me qualify that. I, once upon a time, I dug... I mean, I dug, well, I sold a lot of thimbles that I had dug. And I think I maybe got eight bucks for them and regretted it after I did it. I mean, I was like, I wish I had those thimbles. Back. And that was probably, I mean, that's like 15 years ago I huh. did that. Hmm. And um, now to, to say that I have bought relics or collections from other people who I know they're good relics to just have in my collection. And I have sold them. After the fact, you know, like, like for example, I just sold some buttons uh, recently because I was in the process of buying a new camera. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but there weren't buttons I dug. So I don't dig my personal finds. Too much work and effort goes into it. <laughs> and, um, but, you know, if it's something I don't really have an attachment to, yeah, I mean, I will, but I don't dig personal stuff. Right. <clears throat> All right. Well, hey, let's start talking about a little bit about machines. What, what are you swinging these days? Uh, my go-to machine right now is a Technetics T2, and I've got, and I, and I really, I bounce around from it. I'm trying to figure out what my dog is doing back here. <laughs> Chewing up your um, uniform. Keep her with the uniform. <laughs> that's Essie, by the way, if you're just logging in. Right, um, what's up, I've Essie? I've got tech, I, I switch between the Technetics T2, I got the T2 Plus, and the T2 SE or the Limited. It depends on whether you're from America or England, whether it's the Limited or the, uh, the SE. Um, but the, um, I, I really like the boost mode on the plus, which mm -hmm. they took from the limited. Um, but it's still simplified like the classic. Uh, but just having the boost mode doesn't mean always to run in it because if you like, I've found like in really heavy iron, sometimes that can overload the machine. So sometimes you might want to take it off the boost mode and run it, you know, in, in, uh, say, you know, you know, two plus tones or something like that. And um, you know, it, it, it can read the ground a little bit better. But, yeah, right now I'm a T2 user. Yeah. Uh, Digging with Deej sent this uh, question in uh, via email to me. And you all can do that, too. If you guys uh, see a guest I have coming up and you want to send me questions ahead of time, just send them to DK at Adventures in Dirt, like Digging with Deej did. And she wants to know, do you think, um, do you think the T2 is more of a relic machine than a coin machine? Um, well, I mean, I've dug a lot of coins with the T2. So, I mean, I, the, the one I wear, I mean, I, I know you can't see it, but it's a 1788 two real um, that I dug at a plantation site here, actually here in the upstate of South Carolina. Dug wow. With the T2. How long ago uh, was that? Um, just a couple, it was a couple of years ago. Oh, wow. Um, nice. But I mean, I, I think it's, it's a, it's a great coin machine. I mean, obviously it's a great relic machine, I think the biggest advantage it has is its ability to deal with heavy iron. And so like when you're talking recovery speed, so like if, if you're coin shooting, 
say in a park where you don't have a lot of iron to deal with. Yeah. It, it may be, I, mean, I guess I'm trying to say maybe you don't need as much as the T2. So other machines can do well. I think your T2 is still going to do well. But if you get into a house site and you're looking for old coins, you're going to be able to separate whether it's silver or copper, like a large cent or something like that, um, very effectively. Now, honestly, we hunt with the with the five inch coil oh, most yeah. of the time. I mean, even in a field, uh, we'll pull the five inch coil out because one, it makes you slow down to cover more ground, but it separates the targets out amongst the iron to me a lot more effectively. Yeah, I don't have a smaller coil. I really that's something I really want to get. Is I, a I think smaller everybody coil. should have mm. that in their arsenal. Um, I mean, honestly, deeper is not necessarily always better. Um, you want to make sure you can hear the tone out of the middle of the iron. So, yeah, you know, bigger coils might get you more get you know get you more depth, but you know, I think maybe you know sometimes that's not everything. Yeah, I do have a T two though. You know, you know, I have a T two right. Yeah, I know where you got that. I gave it to you. Well, I didn't give it to you. Greg is I such a nice call guy. Me. I called him and said, can I have a T2? And he just said, sure, Ken, here you go. Here, who else? Nice if guy. You want to, just give me your name. I'll send you no. I no, wish. Greg was now, having a... Uh, you know, Ken was in, one of, he entered one of our YouTube contests, and uh, Technetics was generous enough to, I think we gave away um, a, a T2 and a Patriot in that uh, giveaway. Right. And um, and so, yeah, Ken, Ken won the T2. I did. I was so excited. I was in the middle of a supermarket. My buddy there, Tony, 5280 Ventures, texted me. He said, you just won SC Diggers giveaway for I, – I, woo! I'm yelling in the middle of the, uh, yelling in the, middle of the uh, grocery store. I made quite a scene. So that was uh, definitely exciting. Yeah, and I love that machine. Love that machine. Absolutely. So I have the Patriot and the T2. So, uh, yeah, and both uh, great machines. Both, great and, and basically the Patriot is an F70. Yeah. It's just rebranded. Um, and I mean, and honestly, when it came down to the F-75 and the F-70, I like the F-70 better than the 75. I don't know why. I, I've heard that. Did. I've heard that a lot, actually. So, yeah. And Tiger Paul says, uh, where's Palmetto? Um, I think he's probably taking care of all of his daughters. He, he has four daughters. So, um, he's, he's probably doing the daddy thing tonight. So, so I just threw up a picture of, uh, Russ, your digging partner, Paul Meadow, as he's known. Uh, he, I just he, threw up yeah, a picture there. Palmetto, and, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and I have to apologize because I've uh, my feed is is dragging, so I'm not watching the, all the pictures coming up as they go. Yeah, um, I'm I'm watching our feed, so yeah. I'm not seeing all the pictures. So if you do put something up, I'll let uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, let me know. I'll let you know what you what you what you what, what you're up? looking at, what you're not looking at. <laughs> exactly. That's the way this goes sometimes. You know, the the technology of putting one of these things on is a little tricky. It's not 100% worked out yet, but we're trying to get there. We're trying to get there. We're having a good time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, first find. Let's talk about first find. What uh, or first silver? Let's talk about first silver. Okay, first silver. I have to say that my first silver, actually my first significant find, uh, find was probably on my second hunt ever. I had gotten permission at a uh, late 1800s house site that was actually the offices for the local uh, American Red Co uh, Cross office. And uh, I had dug a couple of, I don't know, just pieces of junk and uh, got a real good signal with my bounty hunter quick draw two and um, pulled up a silver coin, uh, which I looked at it and I said, this doesn't look like any silver coin I've ever seen. And it turned out to be a two Reichsmark uh, in a, 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 a Nazi period, uh, World War II period um, uh, silver coin because it has the swastika and everything on I it. I put a picture of it too, so just so, so you know. Yeah, I got a picture so, up below you there. Yeah, and so as... Um, you know, as that goes, you know, I didn't even realize that I'd really dug, because I'd never dug silver before. And so I was like, okay, this is cool. But then once I realized what it was, I was like, this is real cool. And, uh, you know, it's kind of like gold fever. Uh, once once it gets in your blood, you're like, yeah, this is pretty cool. I like this. Yeah. And so, yeah, that two rights mark, it'll always, it, it, it's, you know, it's not, it has no real big value or anything. Um, but it, it always sits right in the center of my, my display cabinet. Yeah, it's an awesome, it's an awesome looking coin. <laughs> I know we talked about it and I was able to go out and grab a, a video of it. I mean, actually a, a photo of it. So yeah, looking cool, looking really great. So what about, um, 
Yeah, I'm going to put up a picture here. You tell me a little bit about it. I'm going to put a picture of you holding a U.S. plate. Um, and where did you find that at? Was that at a DIV or was that at a different dig? No, the, 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 the plate there um, came from a DIV, and I don't remember which number it was, uh, but it's um, it was actually the first plate I ever dug. And uh, it, we were up on, I guess, what became known as uh, the, I guess it was the Wisconsin camp. And I mean, people who've been to a DIV, you'll know which one um, uh, at, at Brandy Rock that was a Wisconsin camp. And um, I got a good signal using the, the Garrett Infinium, and the target I dug out of the hole was actually a silver mechanical pencil. Hmm. And I was like, okay, well, that's pretty cool. And so, you know, once I, you know, finished uh, finding the target, I swung back over the hole, got another target, and, um, you know, started digging around and saw the white of the of what was going to be a plate. I mean, when I saw the white lead, uh, the back end, I was like, I know what this is. And <laughs> wow. so I, I, I ran up the hill, got, uh, you know, got one of my buddies. And uh, so that way he could run the camera while I was digging it out. Uh, it was kind of cool that r while I was digging out, um, Steve Sylvia from uh, uh, North South Trader. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if you know Steve, but he's kind of a, a legend in the hobby. Mm. Uh, he happened to be right there when I was digging. So it was kind of cool to have somebody who's really kind of considered, you know, a, a grandfather of relic hunting there when I found my first plate. Yeah. Uh, and so, I mean, you know, nothing, you know, nothing's like digging your first one. I mean, I mean, you know, I had the shakes and everything from that. I bet. That is just an absolutely amazing. Um, hey, Ozark Detectors wanted to know a little bit. Have you ever had a fear of putting yourself out there on the videos? You know, a fear of sitting in front of the camera. I mean, how'd you, how'd you get over that one? A lot of you people, know, a lot of people don't was, like getting in front of the camera. It was kind of weird. And I guess it probably comes to the fact that I teach and, you know, public speaking is not that big of a deal for me. And when I first started doing it, there weren't that many people watching us anyway. <laughs> so I don't know. It, you know, putting yourself out there is a hard thing to do. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I learned early on in the process is for people, for your for your channel to really grow and for people to connect with you, they need to know know you and see your face rather than just hear your voice and seeing the target you dug. So I think I realized it was a necessity early on and not that I was trying to make myself famous because by no means I'm not famous. I'm no nugget noggin or bow I'm at, you know, aqua chigger. Um, you know, not that I wouldn't, you know, take their subscribers in a second. Um, but, you know, just trying to be who you are and, you know, you know, I, and, and that's always been my philosophy about my channel anyway, is that, um, you know, if, if I didn't have something good to show, I wasn't going to show it. Um, if I had some finds, I would show them. If, you know, if, if it, there's, there's so much, so much video I've shot that's never, never made it to YouTube because I didn't think it was worth somebody else's time to sit down and watch. But, but yeah, you know, it's, it is probably, that's probably the hardest thing to overcome in terms of starting a channel is that um, apprehension of, you know, talking to a camera and then putting it online for potentially thousands of people to see. So <laughs> some people are more comfortable with it than others, I guess. Have you ever had an embarrassing situation where you've been out sort of in public and you're trying to put something on film and everyone's looking at you like you're just talking to this inanimate object? <laughs> yeah, well, no, it's, you know, at, at hunts, that's not that big a deal yeah. because most everybody knows what you're doing. But, you know, I've done some video uh, like my wife and I have, uh, several antique foods. So we do a lot of thrifting, a lot of, um, you know, estate auctions and things like that. And so, uh, you know, I'll take my camera into the thrift store every once in a while. And, you know, first of all, you know, just trying to make it not obvious that I'm recording. And then of course, if I'm like in, you know, the, the thrift store also make it look like I'm not walking around talking to myself. You know? Um, <laughs> It's that, that's that's that I have a little bit of apprehension about just being in public. But like I said, in the in the metal detecting world, especially at an organized hunt, you know, most everybody knows what you're doing anyway. Um, but yeah, in public, it's a little bit more difficult. I was watching one of your early videos and uh, it was funny. You're walking around one of the DIVs and uh, everyone had that look on their face, you know, <laughs> everyone had that look on their face like, 
guy's putting a camera in my face. You know what I mean? Because you're just filming everyone. But it wasn't as it wasn't as normal of a thing back then as no, it is no. now. So everyone when looked first, a little shocked, you know? No, when I very first started doing it and, um, you know, doing videos and going to organized hunts, again, there were – it was like, like me and Sal were like the only couple of guys that were really – putting together videos. Uh, I mean, there was very few of us doing it. Matter of fact, I remember, um, and I don't remember which DIV it was, but I remember Rose uh, Kendrick, uh, she contacted me before the event. She says, you know, do you happen to have a hat and a DVD that you might could give away? And I, I said, yeah, sure. And she goes, well, we've, we've got a kid that's coming to the hunt with his granddad, and he says that you are kind of his is I'd say idol because it sounds so bad, but he really looks up to you yeah. as far as relic hunting goes. And it turns out it, it, um, it, it was Nugget Noggin. No <laughs> um, no and kidding. so, no kidding. so the very first time I met Michael was at a DIV, and he was probably 15, 14, 15 <laughs> years old at the time. And yeah, he wanted one of my hats and DVDs. Now, awesome? I mean, he, you know, I hate to say it, he, he makes a living doing this right. because he's got an incredibly successful channel. Um, right. And I could only wish for a, a tenth of that, you know, YouTube success. Sure. I mean, and let me say that I, I don't do this for the subs or, I mean, I definitely don't make a living doing it for sure. Um, I started doing this. I always told myself I was going to video my hunts, whether anybody watched it or not, because yeah. it was my way of recording and preserving for history, what I've found, uh, people do it in log books or, you know, however they record it on the computer. The video record was my log of my finds. And if some people wanted to watch that great. And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've just passed over 14,000 subscribers Awesome. and all you and all you in the, um, the live chat over here, you're in YouTube right now. If you don't subscribe to saving history, with SC Digger, go do it. Then, well, do it after the show's over, but do it while you're in YouTube. <laughs> you can multitask. Um, Come on, you guys but can do yeah, it. Yeah, I didn't do it for, um, you know, I, I didn't do it because of that. That's not why I started. Um, but yeah, it's kind of cool to be able to go places and have a conversation with somebody who says, I loved seeing that, or you inspired me. I mean, I've had people that say, I got into detecting because of watching your videos. That's great. That's awesome. Well, I'll tell you, man. I'll tell you, you know, I've only been doing this for a few years. And one of the, when I realized there was videos to watch, you were one of the first people I started watching. And I always appreciated you. So I'm a fan. Absolutely. Uh, I, I appreciated you because because you were just showing you were just showing, you know, the hunt and the finds and the stuff you're finding. And whenever I'd feel like, oh, I'm, you know, it's hard for me to get out except for on the weekend. So all week long, if I'm watching a video thing, I'm like, man, I wish I could get out. The next best thing would be to watch somebody else find something great. Yeah, I'll do the same and it thing. seemed like you were always on the good stuff. So I do the same thing. Yeah. It's always great. So, hey, everyone in chat, uh, why don't you guys throw down what you think, uh, what, what you from your own personal experience, uh, what your first silver was. If everyone's dug a silver, what your first silver was, throw it up there in chat. And then in a minute, we're going to do a giveaway. We're going to give away one of my weekly dirt T-shirts, uh, and we're going to do it in a way. We're going to have you all guess a number between 1 and 100 for that. And when uh, we've pre-selected a number for that, and when I say go, you guys are going to go, just go to town, as many numbers as you want between 1 and 100. We're going to get to that in just a second. So get your numbers prepared. Think about what you want to put down. And then when we see a winner, we'll call stop, and we'll put that off. And then I think we have another giveaway to do a little later here in the show. But if you're just joining us, we're Digger Spotlight here with Greg Tony with Saving History from SC Digger. Oh, look at that. What's that, Greg? That is a Technetics Tech Point pinpointer. It is a PI pinpointer, and uh, it's solid as a rock, waterproof, and it's going to belong to somebody in this chat right here before we're done tonight. How how, how awesome is that? <laughs> I know I own it. I own its uh, his its sister, its brother. I don't know what you want to say, but the F Pulse. I own the F Pulse yeah. and absolutely love it. Uh, that thing is just a great pinpointer. So. Whoever's lucky enough to win that tonight, you really got a great pinpointer on your hands, I'm telling you. And we want to, uh, I'm very thankful of you, Greg, for uh, putting that 
putting that together and, and able to put that out there. So yeah, we'll do well, that one. We'll thank, do that we'll one thank, in a little we'll bit. We'll thank Technetics for that. Uh, they they were the ones that were generous enough to to donate it for the show. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Technetics. We definitely appreciate that. Uh, awesome, awesome stuff. Uh, so everyone's typing in what their favorite silver or their first silver was. That's awesome. Uh, you know, as I'm asking Greg questions tonight, feel free to comment in the chat uh, and answer the questions yourself to kind of help get to know each other. And also the little dots, if you go next to somebody's name in chat, you'll see three little dots appear on the right-hand side. If you click that and go to their channel, go ahead and sub them if you're not a sub already. Check out their channel. But first, you have to make sure you're a sub of Saving History with SC Digger. And I wouldn't mind if you were a sub of Adventures in Dirt. Also, that would be awesome. So good to see everyone showing up in, in, in chat. I know we haven't talked to people here in a while. I'm just trying to look back and chat here. Adventure Archaeology, I see. Matt with Gone Digging showed up. Digging Juggernaut showed up. Hoosier Hillbilly is in the house. Zach Fisher, I see. Youper Digger. Tin Cup Tim. Man, Dog is my co-pirate. Hey, man, congratulations on your $5 gold coin, Nathan. That was an awesome video to watch. It was really cool for you to take us live to, to the jewelry store, to the coin shop, and get that thing checked out while you were all uh you know secretly recording in your pocket there that was pretty cool so <laughs> congratulations buddy all right greg here comes the question do you have a favorite find do you have a favorite find favorite find okay i could probably i probably link to two things when i started this hobby my goal was to dig a south carolina civil war button that was, I mean, that's why I started. I said, I want to dig a South Carolina button. And about two months in, I found a little Confederate camp um, up here in the upstate of South Carolina. Only one I've found up here and um, dug a silver South Carolina button. So I'm like, okay, well, two months in, I can't quit. So no, that, that, that still was one of my goals. Um, but I mean, I think really my favorite find is one that probably has the most historical value and probably the most monetary value, even though um, I'd really never sell it. I'll let my children worry about that. Uh, probably goes to my Charleston slave tag. Um, it represents a very, unfortunately, dark period in our history, uh, but it's also very important for us to, to, to recognize and remember that. I, I, you know, it's, there's no more than about two or 300 known in existence. Um, they I threw only... a picture up. Is that it? Is that the picture? Okay. Are you able to see uh, that? Let me see if again, because my thing, my feed not okay. reloading. So, um, so I'm gonna hit the reload here, refresh, and see if it shows up. Hopefully, it won't knock me out. Um, but it's um, it was a um, 1847, uh, and it was dug in Charleston. If wow. anywhere along the way you've come across a tag that says it's from anywhere else than Charleston, it's not real bottom line i don't care what anybody tells you uh they only uh, existed in charleston and what was called charleston neck yeah that's it right there oh, wow. uh the porta tag and um i apologize because my my wife right, yeah. uh, but um that was an amazing day when i when i dug that and um again you know probably most historical find most uh you know valuable find if you want to put a dollar value on it um it's an amazing find i'm telling you yeah, it goes, goes to that so so where's the most historical place you think you've been able to dig at like what if you think about all the places that you've gone to dig and i'm going to ask you about how you do your research without giving yeah. too much away here in a minute but uh what do you think is the most historical place you've gone to dig i mean i think the most historical place that i've been on has probably been stoneman switch in stafford county virginia um i mean it was it was a winter camp for um, the entirety of the war. It saw both Confederate and Union occupation. Uh, it was a supply depot. I mean, I've, you, know, w you know, with the organized hunts, I've gotten to, to hunt some places that were extremely historic, places that, you know, without that, I'd never be able to go on by myself. Um, uh, now, that said, Essie, once again, um, sorry. <laughs> she looked right uh, at you. I, and I told you before this all started. I said nobody's here. My wife's traveling with work. <laughs> the kids are at college. The only thing I would have to worry about would be if the dog started barking. Right? <laughs> That's right. Of course. The no, dog problem, no problem. No problem. 
Anyway, um, <laughs> but I mean, it's probably the most historic site that I've ever been on is the the British camp that me and Russ found wow. um, because of what it stood for. I mean, these were British soldiers that were on their way basically up to build, um, um, you know, an outpost fort to fight the frontier, fight, you know, to protect anybody living in the wilderness against the Indians. And this was mid-1700s. So, I mean, there literally was very little, if anybody, living up this way. And the coins we pulled out um, reflected that. Huh. Uh, the artifacts we pulled, you know, pulled out of there, the relics. Uh, you know, the buttons, this was, this was before marked buttons. Uh, there were no marked plates, anything like that, but we're, you know, digging shoe buckles, flat buttons. Yeah. That's probably the most historical site and nobody, you know, other than us, basically other than me and Russ, nobody knows it exists. Yeah. Well, Hey, let's give away a shirt real quick. I was talking earlier about, uh, I was going to give away, a um, <clears throat> a, weekly dirt shirt for those of you who aren't familiar i run a weekly series every sunday called the weekly dirt where i feature some of my favorite youtube metal detecting channels and what they've been up to lately uh there's an image of the shirt right there i'm going to give away uh we pre-selected a number for this and so when i say go i'm going to have everyone type any number you want from one to a hundred and just keep typing until we see a winner uh, everyone should make sure your chat's on live chat in the upper left-hand corner if you're able to change that from top chat to live chat. Um, right now, I think I only got one moderator in the room, so Tony, you're going to have to keep an eye on that if you could. Um, when I say stop, I'll let you know who it was. Well, there they go. So go, everyone go. <laughs> They're going to go anyways. Number. Yeah, sure, absolutely. No, I know the number. <laughs> go ahead, type it in. No, Jesus, don't do it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I know right. your number. You know my number. All right. Stop, stop, stop. We have a winner. We already have a winner. How fast was that? How fast was that? Crazy, crazy, They're crazy. Still typing. They are, but it'll take a while because of, because of the delay. But oh, okay. I got we, you. We do have a winner, so everyone, please stop. I've stop. seen it. So my number was 23, and I see that MG. MG. Yeah. Right there. Uh, I didn't see anybody before. MG put it in there. So, MG, you are the lucky winner of a weekly dirt T-shirt. Uh, send me an email, please, at dk at adventures in dirt. Give me your size and your mailing address. Or actually, MG actually is a member of my treasure hunting club here, the Eureka Treasure Hunting Club. And uh, so I could actually bring it to the next club meeting if you like. Uh, congratulations, MG. Good job. Great job. Uh, boy, everyone was real close. That that went real quick. But hey, uh, stay. Stay tuned. We have uh, another giveaway coming here pretty soon. Um, I wanted to uh, get back here to the screen where I can see what's going on. All right. So where did you uh, – I want to put up something here. I want to put up a picture of this SC, the South Carolina plate um, that Russ dug in one of your videos. Um, let me get rid of the shirt picture first. There we go. Put this up. Everyone check this out. Everyone take a look at this plate. Uh, can you tell me about this plate, Greg? What makes it so special and why it's such a great find for those of us that don't know that much about your part of the country? Okay, so what you're looking at there is a pre-Civil War um, stamped brass South Carolina militia plate. And, you know, clearly, you know, me and Russ, the sites we hunt, especially the Civil War sites, um, and even the earlier sites that we try to find up here and up here in low, low country, wherever we are. Um, I mean, you know, our, you know, what we'd love to get into is South Carolina stuff, whether it's buttons or, or anything better than that. And we had actually gotten permission on, we'd found and gotten permission on basically a hilltop um, that we thought was a home site. Uh, uh, you know, an early plantation uh, house that he had identified using an old map. And, um, we, you know, walking into the woods, uh, first thing we found a big uh, stack of rocks, um, a big brick pile, and we're like, okay, there's, there's a home site here. And so we started hunting and not finding much. Um, a few flat buttons, a couple of, you know, you know, copper coins, coppers here and there. Uh, and just little buckles and things, but nothing, nothing to write home about. And then Russ, um, I hear him yelling at me 
you know, through the woods, kind of like this dog is back here behind me. Uh, he was yelling at me, and uh, you know, and and I see him like you know doing this number right around his midsection. Like, what in the heck are you doing? And I walked up, and he's got his hands up like this, and then he drops down. I was like, "What in the heck have you dug?" He said, "You won't believe it." You just and I was like, "Okay, well, I'm not gonna believe it until I actually walk up here and see it." And you you can see all this in the video that I captured live as I walk up and I see that piece of brass laying in the hole. And, um, you know, when I saw it, I was like, I, I was as excited as though I had just dug it because it's a bucket list for fine for me. Uh, you know, I'd love to dig a Confederate plate, never dug that, but to dig a Confederate and it, it's even really, it's really pre civil war, but they wore it and wore them into the war, but to dig a South Carolina plate would be, the top for me now go ahead and attach a value to it so people understand the rarity of it that plate is probably valued somewhere in the four to five thousand dollar range holy smokes so that gives you an idea and 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 really that's i I know he's never going to sell it either uh but that at least gives you an understanding of of the rarity of it wow and uh yeah it was a pretty exciting day for both of us me (laughs) to be able to capture it on film and uh, Russ to actually dig it. Now I got to go get mine. <laughs> Absolutely, we all got to go get one now. <laughs> yeah. You know that's why I like that's why I like going out with a with a digging partner, uh, with some friends that are into the hobby. Also, uh, it's for that reason. You know, I, like I go out with my buddy Tony all the time, and I'm just as excited for him when he's finding stuff. Like the last time we hunted together, it's been a while actually. Tony, we need to get out. I think we're gonna head out this weekend. But uh, he we chose two sides of the, of the yard. We went door knocking. So we had two sides of this yard of this 1927 house and we just got our stuff. Cause we were all excited to get the permission and jumped in there. And he said, I'll take the right. I said, okay, I'll take the left. And then I realized that he's in the shade and I'm in the sun, <laughs> but he started getting oh, on God. it, man. He found the spots. He started getting on it a place where they dropped everything. He just got on it. And, you know, and I'm hamming it up in his video, giving him, you know, the look and everything. But, uh, I'll tell you, I was really excited for him because every time he would beep, he'd be like, silver, silver, got silver. I was like, oh, man, you know, are you kidding? And then he'd be like, oh, I think I got another ring. And I'd be like, another ring? <laughs> but it's fun. It's fun when your digging partners find something amazing and uh, you can appreciate it right along you know, with when, them. And- when I first started doing this, I thought, okay, you know, I'm just going to hunt by myself. I'm, you know, why would I want to hunt with somebody else? Because they may find the stuff, you know. And I learned real quick, it's a lot more exciting to dig with somebody, somebody you trust, which is also a hard thing to find in this hobby. But if you find somebody who you can, uh, that you can really trust as a digging partner, um, it, that can share the same enthusiasm, you know, my, my wife, she puts up with it, but she honestly doesn't care. <laughs> you know, I come home with a nice button. She's like, that's nice, dear. Um, <laughs> but you know, you know, I show Russ, if I dig a South Carolina button, he's going to be as excited for me as I would be for him digging something nice too. Somebody it, heard it. I, you know, I'm, I like the documentary part of it too. I get just as excited to be able to capture it on, on video as if I dug it myself. I, I, you know, that's just kind of, I like it. I'm trying to go back and find out who asked the question. I apologize. I can't find okay. you right now, but they said, um, uh, does your wife ever get angry about you bringing all that dirt into the house? <laughs> yeah, I usually leave it outside till she's not here. Then I come in and wash stuff off. I, you know, I've actually become. I mean, I've got, I've got like, you know, my area where just the relics stay, and they're not in here. We're actually in my wife's office, so I'll, I'll go ahead and just kind of let you in that normally. It doesn't look like this. I kind of set it up. So this is not the relic room. That's Actually, not that's not your lipstick container back there on the counter? It's not my Clinique. <laughs> no, it's, yeah, unfortunately. But I figured it looked better than, yeah, you know, makeup. Um, but, you know, she knows my – well, I know. My stuff stays in, 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 the, in the, the man room, I guess you can say. Um, I mean, but she's, she's – I guess I've done it long enough, and she realizes that it's something I'm passionate about, and – yeah, you know, in the big picture, some of it does have some value. So I guess she's she's a little bit more tolerant of it. What about your kids? Are your kids into it? Not at all. No. Not at all. I have uh, I've got a picture um, that I, t- I I took them both detecting at the local school one time, and let them hunt the playground, try to find some quarters or whatever might have been there, 
And within 10 or 15 minutes, they were swinging on the monkey bars. They just, <laughs> they just didn't care. Um, and they really, I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll like my Instagram posts and they'll watch the videos, but they're not into it at all. <laughs> now, my son has a love for videography. I saw uh, that. He, he's a whole heck of a lot better than I am. Uh, matter of fact, if anybody, if you go, if you go to my channel and you watch the channel trailer, um, where it's got a picture of me kind of kneeling down in a cornfield, he actually produced that. And, uh, you can kind of get a picture of his work. It, he's really good at what he does. So I'm, <laughs> I'm thrilled that he actually produced something for me. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I think I, I think I remember seeing that and thinking, wow, well done. Does he hire out for work? <laughs> well, I'll yes, get who I'll start again. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Everyone send your email to SC expensive. Digger. <laughs> He's very expensive. <laughs> you, you don't get any discount or anything like that? <laughs> uh, I think that was the only freebie I got for raising him, I guess. Yeah, gotcha. All right, how about your oldest find? Greg, you have an oldest find? Uh, clearly my oldest find. Uh, not counting Native American stuff. My, my oldest metal detecting find uh, is clearly came out of the British camp. And, you know, to show the kind of stuff that we were digging there, um, Russ dug a 1744 4 real. I dug a 1712 six French 6 deniers, and that wasn't the oldest thing I dug out of there. I dug a 1666 rich fellows farthing um it's it's a british farthing and if you don't know what a farthing is that's kind of like a kind of like a store token but it was also accepted as currency as well now to dig a 1666 farthing in england is not that big a deal to dig a 1666 farthing in upstate south carolina is unheard of i just threw a picture um, of it up there I dug it's it, pretty I dug it in its natural setting yeah. Um, it wasn't like on somebody's chain or it wasn't part of a bracelet and got lost by somebody modern. That was for, for whatever reason, somebody passing through going across that river crossing and stopping on top of that hill. What's the whole rich fellows thing about? That was the name of the fellow, um, that, um, that created the farthing. Oh, I don't no know kidding. If it store owner. It actually has three loaves of bread on it and it was... I, I guess it was his store token, but it's, a, it's attributed to him, um, Rich Fellows, um, is, was, was the guy's name. Wow. Um, and so when I originally dug it, the, the two L's and Fellows, I thought was 7-7. Seven, seven. I thought it was like 1770-something. Oh, wow. Um, but once I researched it and got it identified, realized it was only produced in 1666. Wow. It was the only year that, that token was made. And so that's to me pretty amazing yeah it's amazing. I, think I think i probably have dug in the upstate of south carolina probably one of the oldest coins ever to be dug has, has to be wow how many bullets have you dug in your career <laughs> if you had to guess uh, if you had to throw, are you yeah. like mcdonald's are there 40 billion served or <laughs> yeah well no nothing like that but i mean i know i've dug hundreds of period bullets um, now you want to add in shotgun shells, modern <laughs> bullets. Let's go into the thousands. Yeah. Um, th yeah, there was a time where I kept all those shotgun shell heads, but once I had, you know, you know, 10 or 11 gallon bags, Ziploc bags full of them, <laughs> I didn't keep them so much anymore. Gotcha. And I know some of them, people collect those. Um, but yeah. yeah, I mean, I think I've probably got at least... 20 different types you know oh. if you go to things like gardeners and infields and um you know you know pistol bullets and colts and you know the spencers different kinds yeah i probably got 15 or 20 different variations there's a lot of information just about bullets out there i'll tell you and i oh yeah and i, 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 and I don't know about, bullets. Yeah. i don't know bullets well at all kind of yeah. like artillery I, i've dug fragments and fuses i've never dug a full artillery piece but i, I just don't no, you know, you give me a, you know, some people, they can see a fragment and tell you exactly what shell it's from. Yeah. I can't do that. Well, hey, let's give away this, uh, let's give away this, do this next giveaway. Feel like doing that? How do you, how do you want to do it, Greg? How do you feel like, how do you feel like doing well, that? We, we could, we could do the same route. Um, let Essie tell us what number, Essie, what number? Okay. We got the number. Got the number. Okay. And so Excellent. what we're going to do is the same thing we did for the shirt. Can we see that? A little bit of light ref reflection. And 
Okay, okay, we're going to use that one instead. Okay, all right. All right. So we got the number, and so when uh, whenever Ken says go, not me, but whenever Ken says go, start posting your numbers, and we'll watch. And um, what range are we going to do? What range do you want to do? It's a pretty um, special giveaway right here. It's worth a lot of money right well, there. I, I know, but let's let's um, let's let's broaden it out a little bit to uh, to one fifty. So spread it out just a little bit between one and one fifty. All right. And, and um, we'll we'll keep an eye on it, and when we see it, maybe we'll tell you, maybe we won't. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, Greg. You say go whenever you're ready. You've got the pinpointer. It's a great, great giveaway, and we really appreciate you doing this, and of course, Technetics, of course. So okay. you say go. Well, uh, if you want to win a Tech Point pinpointer, courtesy of Technetics, post a number between one and one hundred and fifty and do it now all right let's go everyone i see two numbers well yeah. it's probably got a lag going it's gonna, on. yeah it's gonna go all right they're coming now yeah like i said i have kind of a kind of poor i got at&t so it's kind of slow sorry i'm just not a diss on at&t but it is slow yeah see, i drank that water some time yeah. ago that i'm seeing yeah I know, I'm sorry, I keep hitting the mic. And I'm taking my mouse and scrolling up so to slow it down a bit, but uh, we'll keep going here. I haven't... Uh... There's, some, there's some close ones. Hey, yeah, yeah, and also I wanted to mention that my moderator's involved in this. Yeah, absolutely. I have not shared the number with my moderator, Tony, over there, so absolutely go for oh, it, well, Tony. Oh, well, absolutely. Yep. But, yeah, there's some that have that've been close, but nobody's hit it yet. Um, Can people guess more than once oh yeah yeah absolutely okay. just type numbers in as fast as you want just keep typing them i think i see it uh, i think i see it so why does everyone stop um i think somebody got it it's gonna check the number and make sure it's the right number um i missed it so i didn't see it okay. probably my lag yeah yeah i do see it but I need to go up and uh, and check. So, Tony, when we give you the number and announce the number, you're going to have to go back and see if anybody earlier had it. And what I'll do is I'm just going to make sure I'm going to let Tony make the deciding factor uh, if if he sees somebody earlier had it. Uh, I'm looking right now, and I don't really see it. No, I don't see it. Um, so uh, I will tell you that the number was 87. And I see that Uper Digger, 57, had 87. <clears throat> Just between Mark Sexton and Digging Juggernaut. Uh, so Uper Digger, if everything works out, it looks like you are the lucky winner of a Technetics Tech Point Pinpointer. Cool. Yeah, and if you want... Uh, Unless my moderator goes back and says, no, you blind bat. <laughs> you missed this person. So let me know, Tony, if you would. Um, I don't see anybody earlier than Uper Digger with 87. So congratulations, Uper Digger. Send me an email at dk at adventures in dirt. Give me your mailing address. I'll pass it along to Greg, and he'll make the arrangements to uh, get you that pinpointer. Very good. Sounds awesome, man. Congratulations. I still never saw it. So. <laughs> no, you still never saw it. Yeah. I think that's it. So. Well, like I said, I got the lag going on, so it's, yeah. uh, it's skipping on me. <laughs> but, yeah, once once uh, Ken uh, gets that information, sends it along to me. Um, actually, um, this is actually my pinpointer box. Technetics is going to send it directly to you from El Paso, Texas. Very good. So it's coming. Very good. Are you into genealogy at all? Have you traced your family history back? And uh... I used to do that. I, I, I did a lot of that research way back when. Um, and again, was mostly so I could try to identify if I had any Civil War veterans in my um, family. And uh, actually realized I have uh, four grandfathers that, that served. Uh, I've got a, a great, great grandfather who was in the 19th South Carolina, who was killed at the Battle of Murfreesboro. I've got uh, a great-great-grandfather uh, that was a member of the 2nd South Carolina. I've got another, I had actually had two 
a second South Carolina. Um, two were in the 19th South Carolina because they were all from Edgefield. And then I've got one that was a, um, uh, a great, great grandfather that was in the 46th North Carolina and was actually a prisoner at Point Lookout, Maryland. Hmm. And what's kind of neat because they have a picture um, of him at the museum at Point Lookout. Oh, man. Um, how amazing so that, is that? That's kind of cool. So, and I do have one great, 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 four greats uh, that was a Revolutionary War uh, veteran from North Carolina. Wow. So, yeah, that, that kind of got me started, uh, you know, because I had that in- interest in history. Yeah. And I said, well, since I have so many uh, direct descendants who were were Civil War veterans, that's kind of what got me started on what, on South Carolina stuff. So. It's addicting, boy, once you get in. I know I got into it about five or six years ago and end up meeting all kinds of other distant family members that were out there searching too. So it's a lot of fun. Did, um, you know, for somebody from Colorado, you know, we don't have a lot of uh, Civil War history here and uh, not a lot of history history. Uh, but, um, yeah, you'd have to come out sometime and teach me how to dig and how to go look for uh Indian artifacts because I still haven't figured that I'm out, sure. but I would love I'm to. Sure you've got it. I'm sure. I'm sure got we it. do. Absolutely. I just love to figure out how to figure out how to go start searching for that. But how do you high ground, research high your ground near water? High ground near water. High ground near water. That's what you're looking for. Mm-hmm. Uh, how do you go about starting researching information on Civil War camps and pl- well, locations what, you might want to go I, dig? What I've learned is that if it's well known. Like if it's something that showed up in the ORs or everybody knew there was a battle here, those places, whether people had permission or not, have probably been looked at. Um, The more public it ever was, the less of a chance of it not ever being found. We we do, and and Russ is a much better researcher than I am. Uh, He's kind of my research guy. Um, And I guess I'm the technology guy, but he... um, well, we we do a lot of reading of of diary. They the the British camp we found. Russ actually found. I say we. I got to hunt it. I was <laughs> privileged to be there. Um, but it came from kind of knowing the general area where they were traveling. But then he found a a passage in a diary that was written in the mid 1700s um, by. A lady, and basically she made a, a just like a one sentence comment about the fact that from she said something like from the house we can see the we can see the the the, the British camp or we can see the British troops camped across the river. Oh man, it's basically all she said. Well, it started off by the fact that Russ found where this house site was. Um, it was kind of like a, 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 a I get not really known, but by using convergence of rivers and where roads ran. We identified where the house was, and so we said, well, somewhere across that river, she can see a camp. And so basically, once we got access and permission to that that property, we headed to the top of the hill, and the, the first thing he dug was a musket ball, and the second thing he dug was a shoe buckle, and he sent me a text going, look what I just found. <laughs> and so um, <laughs> we, used, uh, we used historic aerials a lot. Um, where we'll cross-reference, say, like, if we get permission on a property, we'll find it on the historic aerials, uh, historicaerials.com, and then use the slider tool and go back as far as you can, you know, whatever the oldest aerials they have. And even the, you know, even if they don't have aerials, if you go back to the, sometimes they have topographical maps there. Sure, yeah. And uh, some of the old, I mean, some of the early, late 1800s, turn of the century topographical maps have house sites in house sites indicated on them as well, and you just do this use a slider and kind of look at where you know the modern day image compare it to an old map and, and historic aerials is invaluable really. Yeah, it's an amazing site. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. You know, sometimes you can't get you know top to go back so so far. I think you know we've given 1895 around here is about as early as it gets. And uh, but yeah, I love that site. It's a great site. So what? Um, so where do you have any other? Do you hunt any other? Uh, have you been featured in some magazines? Have you been featured in American Digger magazine? Or have you gotten oh, your yeah. finds oh, in there? Yeah, I've been. I've I've had stuff in, um, lots of stuff in American Digger. Actually, when they first started, I was on their editorial staff, um, uh, with with Butch and them, and just my time just didn't allow me to continue to do that. Uh, but I've had stuff on the cover. 
I've had uh, I've written articles. I've had lots of just uh, just dug stuff in American Digger. I have had stuff in uh, Western and Eastern Treasure magazine. Um, actually, have been fortunate enough to have uh, two of my finds chosen as finds of the year for oh, Western and Eastern Treasure. Really? Uh, w- one was back in the in the uh, the early two thousands, like two thousand and two, I think, uh, was a a cast. Uh, brass one piece CSA button and my slave tag also made it back uh, was it, when was that 2015 or so uh, when I dug that so I've actually had two finds there um, uh, featured I've actually had uh, the the local uh, um, I, I don't know, the local business magazine did a, uh, a, a story on me once which was kind of cool uh, so I had everybody locally going what do you think <laughs> so uh, that was kind of neat. So, but uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm I'm a shameless self promoter. I will uh, certainly, <laughs> if I got a chance to uh, do, do a little PR, I will. <laughs> do you ever donate any of your finds to local historical societies or museums or anything? Well, I had the opportunity, um, and I think it's called the Smith McDowell House, which is up in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, I had the opportunity, or I was asked to come do a dig there. And the story was, it was always written in the books and stuff that, that somewhere along the way, some little girl who lived in the house had a gold ring and uh, that she had lost it somewhere along the way. And, um, and they'd even interviewed, uh, you, know, her, you know, her granddaughter who passed on the story and on. And so we got to hunt the, um, the Smith McDowell house. And about two hours in, I got a, um, a low target. And I dug a child's gold ring very near the window where the story said that she had tossed it out the window. And now we can't, you know, 100% say that was it. But at the same time, um, WLOS, Channel 13 from Asheville and Channel 7 from Spartanburg, WSPA, felt it was enough to do a story about it. And I got to be on TV and all kind of fun stuff. So. Yeah, but but going into it, I knew I was giving the museum there everything that we found. I've given homeowners lots of stuff. I mean, after a while, I mean, you know, it, I hate to say it's just stuff, but because it, it's not just stuff. But I mean, when when you dig so much brass and stuff, you just don't need all those hill plates or you know, you know, just nondescript buckles and flat buttons and things. I mean, uh, Indian head pennies, I'll give those away. If I dig silver, I'm keeping silver unless I've, I've already told I was going to give it to them. But I mean, I, I give landowners lots of stuff uh, just for the privilege of being able to hunt their property. Yeah, so, sure. so I, I think if you're willing to give back, whether it be um, where you can put it in a public place like a museum or the landowner as a thank you. I think it's important we do that. Right. How often do you get to go out these days? How, how often are you getting out? Probably not, not quite this enough. Summer, <laughs> this summer, not at all. This summer was freaking hot. 95 degrees. Um, all of, we, we have at least, we call it digging season, yeah. which is basically January, February, and March. No kidding. Uh, anything outside of that is a bonus because it gets hot and I'm old and I can't take it anymore. Uh, I watch these kids like, like Britton Lockhart, you know, those guys who were digging in July and it's 98 degrees in Atlanta and they're <laughs> just pumping it. And uh, I just can't do that anymore. But you know, yeah. the fields that we have access to are all planted in crops like cotton and soybean, the woods, they got too many creepy crawlies for me in the summer. And, uh, <laughs> I don't like ticks and snakes and um, deer season starts in the low country, August, middle of August and runs through January 1st. So that limits us to digging season, which is January, March and February. So the woods are not down, the crops are gone and it's either cold or cool. So, so if I ever, ever visit that part of the uh, country, that's the time I want to come. Huh? That's, that's the time you want to be down. <laughs> awesome. I'll have to remember that one. <laughs> so is there any place you want to dig? Is there any place you haven't been yet that is kind of on your wish list to go, my, uh, my to go dig? My bucket list? Well, I want to go to – I mean, I know it's kind of stereotypical, but I want to go to England. I mean, you see, you know, these people digging Roman stuff. I mean, that's – you know, that, that would be 
fun to do, I think. Um, kind of out of my budget, but I would love to do that one day. Just, I mean, just the, the history they're on top of versus what we have here. Right. Uh, but one of my bucket listers is I, I want to go, I want to go pan for gold in Alaska. Uh, I don't know why, but that's one of my things. Panning for gold in Alaska, uh, going to Ireland and drinking a Guinness from a local pub. Um, I did make it to Maine and eat a lobster. So I've gotten those things done. Uh, so, so yeah, you know, going to, going to England and digging Roman and, uh, going to Alaska and digging gold. <laughs> that, that, that's what's on my bucket list. That'd be awesome. You can head to Arizona too. Mr. Telly Solomon's inviting you out to go to Arizona to go do some digging of some gold in Arizona. There's a lot of gold in yeah, Arizona. Probably can't be there. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, I'll go with him. I'll go with him. There you go. <laughs> uh, yeah, we just got into, you know, about five years ago, I got into some gold pan around here in Colorado. Really small gold here in the creeks in Colorado, gold. but uh, gold is gold. Yeah. That's right. Color is color. So, awesome. Well, hey, man, you know, I really appreciate you being being on with me tonight. I know that it's been, uh, uh, we've gone a little long, and I knew we would because I had a lot of questions for you, and I, and I know people really appreciated uh hearing from you and we need to do a part two somewhere along the way that would be you know that would be much <laughs> much invited i'm telling you we should think about that um but yeah hey i i want to thank you for coming along do you have uh anything you want to say to the chat room or anything you want to leave us with as far as um um so another question came in as uh has greg ever been to the angel oak, the angel oak. yes oh, you because uh, there's an insurance commercial that's using the Angel Oak as part of their commercial now, so everybody knows who the Angel Oak is. Um, I've I've been there. It's an amazing site. Um, you know, clearly uh, it's it's protected. It's fenced in the the, the, the park where it's at. Uh, so digging around it, even though I I'm sure somewhere over time people have hunted around it, um, but the Angel Oak is an amazing. Um, tree to see um and i've hunted sites in the area so i mean so yeah i've been down there for sure yeah youper was asking if the t2 were good and higher in soil we talked about that earlier we were talking about taking it out to div and stuff but uh so hey i'm gonna i'm gonna let you go i want to just thank you greg for coming on with them and everyone if you're not a fan already of saving history with se digger you really got to go over to the links i've got down below check out his stuff you're really going to become a fan i'm sure of it uh he's just got a lot to offer and uh yeah the next time we get on it'll probably be all about uh indian artifacts i could talk to you about that for that, hours because i want to <laughs> okay that works for me we can do some show and tell right well hey everyone uh you know say say your thank yous to greg for being on for this that's awesome greg why don't you hang out for a little bit and i'm going to go ahead and start wrapping up and then uh everyone in chat listen when i shut this down you're going to see a screen you're going to hear music playing you're going to have two or three four or five minutes to go ahead and finish your conversations so you guys don't have to run off anywhere but i'm just going to go and close this down so greg thank you again i appreciate you being a guest here on uh, digger spotlight um talk to you here in the soon okay absolutely yep all right hey that was not great man uh greg tony saving history with sc digger you really need to go over to his channel and check out his stuff check out his instagram he's always posting his great finds on his instagram page and uh it's it's just it gets you motivated you find you watch his stuff and it just really gets you motivated so but everyone, thank you for being active in chat and for asking questions. I really appreciate it. Uh, thank you for the moderators that showed up tonight and for all your help. I really appreciate that. You, you guys really helped me out a lot. And uh, big thumbs up to you guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, next on, I'm coming up, as I think uh, I have to check the date, but I'll get back to you. But it's uh, at the end of this October. I'm going to have uh, Jason Quarterhorter. Jason Quarterhorter is going to be with me uh, as my next guest on Digger Spotlight. I'll be promoting the date. Uh, I think it's the Halloween, day before Halloween, something like that. And the time might change, so we need to get that information out to you. But make sure you come along with that and prepare your questions. That's going to be a fun time. I don't know if we're wearing costumes or not. and haven't figured that one out. But uh, thank you all for coming and watching Digger Spotlight. I'm going to go ahead and shut it down here. But again, finish your conversations. Don't go anywhere. This music's going to play. You're going to be able to keep chatting. I'm not going to shut the stream down for at least another three to four minutes. So thank you all for coming and participating in Digger Spotlight. I'm DK with Adventures in Dirt. I'll catch you on the next episode. Everyone have a good night. Awesome.